how are you as a musician uh, uh, coping, making the best of this insane situation that is quarantine? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been challenging, of course. And, you know, for us, it it hasn't been fun to have a, our 25th anniversary tour canceled, Jazz Fest, which is my, you know, uh, busiest and most lucrative season of the year canceled and then and then I had a trip with my trio to Japan so you know all of those things of course are the downside of all of this but I've been trying to focus on the upside which is I've had more time at home but I've also had more time to work on things that I've been wanting to work on for years so I've been throwing myself into learning more about filming myself and streaming. And so just Wednesday night, I went live for the first time with my multiple camera switching situation. So I've had multiple cameras for a while, but I haven't been able to stream. Okay. And so. I've been learning about that. I've been consulting with Jim Toscano, who's a great drummer and author and teacher. And he also, he's been doing all this streaming stuff. So he's been consulting several people on all of that. So I've been talking to him three to five times a week. And then I've been doing some of it from my house, but we just moved it for the first time over to my studio Wednesday. So I think that was my, maybe my sixth master class where I've just been doing them for free live mm. on on YouTube, not YouTube, on Facebook. Free live on Facebook. And I deliberately just started with just my computer, just playing into the computer with the sound all distorted. And <laughs> and then the, the next one, I did it on the, the, the silent stroke heads and the, the Zildjian low volume cymbals. So that we didn't overpower the microphone. And by the third one, I had bought an interface and was running microphones through it. Had a lavalier mic with a with a switcher, mm. and you know, just gradually doing things at the house. And then Wednesday was the first time we moved the operation over to my studio with the taking the cameras I already had and running them through the Roland switcher and. So I kind of did did all of that on purpose just to make the process transparent and to show drummers who may be interested in what I'm doing that, you know, I'm we're all in this together. I'm trying to learn how to do this too. And if I can do it while the world watches, then don't be afraid. Like, just <laughs> jump in there, you know? And it's... Well let me ask though, what are you, what are you hoping to, to get out of it? What do you hope others get out of it? Cause Lord knows there's no shortage of drumming videos out there. Um, but you know, and so I'm, but a lot of that is, is from amateurs and things like that, just trying to, to show off and in some respects. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, from your professional perspective, what are you hoping people get out of this? I hope that, you know, what I've come to realize is that, yes, there's an abundance of drumming information out there. There's an abundance of online teachers and videos and online websites. What I want to do is make myself available to the people who decide that I'm their guy, that, mm. that they want to learn what I have to offer. If they want to learn from a guy who has studied brushes with Jeff Hamilton, but has also played double drums with Zigaboo Modaliste, but who also, you know, has learned from Shannon Powell, Herlin Riley, and, you know, has spent 25 Johnny years. Johnny Vidakovich. Yeah, Johnny Vidakovich, and has Sorry. actually spent 25 years on the road touring. And uh, then I'm your guy, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it, it's, it's not a, to me, it's not a competition thing. It's not a, um, it's, I love doing it. I love when I can present something to somebody in a way that makes the light bulb go off and, and I can 
know that I've helped them become maybe a better drummer, maybe a better musician, but then also when they come to me and they tell me, man, that thing that you wrote, I worked on it for months and months and months, and then my band noticed that I had become a better drummer. And then that made me happier, made me more pleasant to be around, and it's made my wife like me more, right? <laughs> so, so like that that's why I get into this. I mean, you know, playing for an audience is one thing. When you're playing for people and you connect with somebody in the front row of the audience, that's a connection and that's great. But when you have somebody come up to you and say, hey, the way that you explained that thing to me, it finally helped it make sense to me and it made me a better drummer, a better musician, and hopefully, you know, nicer to be around. Uh, that all, you know how much time they had to spend on that and you know how much dedication they had to put. And so I really enjoy that connection. And but, and then are you okay with that delayed gratification, you know, or, or did it take any getting used to, if only because, as you, as you mentioned, you know, you're in the club, you're in the live setting, and you can see people reacting, and, and, and I've talked to a number of professional drummers who, you know, there's that, that little, uh, uh, almost tingle you get when you realize someone is moving in sync with your kick drum kind of thing. And it's like, wow, yeah. I'm making people actually move. And there's that instant feedback and, and, and God knows you guys, you know, play an insane number of shows uh, a year on the regular thing. Now suddenly you're doing it and you're putting it out there and you're not seeing, you know, you don't have that immediate connection and there's that delay between when you put it out there and when someone maybe comes back, did that take a lot of adjusting? to get used to? So I would say, you know, when I first started writing articles and, and then wrote my first book, I was playing so many gigs that I didn't, I didn't get that feedback right away. But once I started to get that feedback after years and years and years, you start to realize it's just a different type of connection. Yes, the instant connection, playing gigs and having people moving in time to what you're doing, that's one thing. But even though the, the, the feedback and the reaction when people come to you about something that you demonstrated or explained or wrote, even though that's a delayed reaction, it's also on a deeper level hmm. because you know how much time they had to spend with it. So both of those, those types of feedback are cool and, uh, and I enjoy both of them, but they're just, they're different. And so, you know, right now we can't get that, that real instant in-person reaction from playing music, but these, these live masterclasses that I've been doing, I've got guys that have taught maybe one guy I've taught a couple lessons to one guy is has come to every camp I've ever done and another guy is in my academy and I see them in the in the questions and, and so I'm interacting with them there you know and then when when they're asking me questions in the comments and and I can look at the question and, and they say man the way you just explained that that just I totally get it now so by doing these live masterclasses, um, I am getting some of that instant feedback, which is which is good. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've you know I've really enjoyed that. And but it the two the delayed reaction of the educational materials, I'm okay with it because mm -hmm. I've gotten I've done I've been doing it for so many years now. I think my first book came out in. 2004, but my first articles started coming out maybe right around 2000 or something. So I've been doing this for almost 20 years. And at first it just felt like you were just putting it out into the darkness. Mm -hmm. But now when I'm writing something and I'm sitting here at my computer typing it out, I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> oh, they're going to like this one. This is going to set off some light bulbs. So 
I enjoy that process so much. And, and then I don't mind that it's mm-hmm. a delayed reaction because I have so much stuff out there now that I'm getting reactions from things that I did several months ago or a couple of years ago. So I'm getting that feedback, but then I'm also like, oh, wait till they get a load of this. <laughs> right. uh, they're going to love this. So, and then really staying good. with the, the, the teaching theme, um, I first met you when you did uh, a couple of presentations at PASIC, the drumming convention, um, and it was in Austin that year. And uh, you had you had one which was in a, a big hall, and it was you know amazingly well done. I mean, it's like you had like a beginning, a middle, an end. There were these uh, printed glossy handouts that were already on the the chairs and everything like that. And it was this great mix of everything. I was there with with Rich Redmond, who was going to be doing a presentation the following PASIC, and he's like, "Oh, I'm," he said, "I'm definitely modeling it." on what Stanton did. He said, this is, this is the way to do it. And so I'm wondering, how do you put that together? You know, do you start with an end in mind? Do you start with, all right, this is kind of a theme or do you just go, well, here's, here's something specific groove I want to play and talk about. Yeah. So that's a great question. So I think I've done three of those handouts if I remember correctly. And the first one was focused on Take It to the Street, my first book. And then, so I picked, you know, just a couple of ideas out of that that I wanted to focus on because you only have 50 minutes, right? So yeah. I, um, I picked I picked three things, you know, picked a few things from there. Um, the second one was about Groove Alchemy. So I picked a few ideas and I'm not remembering exactly which ones um, for Groove from from Groove Alchemy to to focus on. And then the third one, I had just done a project with Mark Wessels for Fresh Approach to Drum Set. And I focused on a couple of stickings, right? And and I wanted to show people it, a lot of what I do is no matter what I'm showing people, I like to show them how much you can do with one idea. So it's not about showing people a barrage of ideas. It's about usually taking even, you know, that's the unifying thread in all three of those handouts that I've done is taking an idea, presenting the idea clearly, and then so on. But if you do this with it, you could turn it into this. If you do this with it, you could turn it into this. So, um, so you know, the beginning, middle, end, uh, thank you for saying that. I mean, I, I've done a lot of clinics and master classes, so those have been a lot of dry runs for me. So by the time I get to something like PASIC, you know, it. I liken it sometimes to to being a comedian, you know, um, <laughs> a, a stand-up comedian. By the time you see him on the big stage, he's tried this material out mm-hmm. in smaller venues, and he knows what works and he knows what doesn't work. So by the time I hit the basic stage, I've often really presented this many times. Now, that is the case up until this last PASIC that I just did, I was a little nervous because my theme was learning through teaching, right? Okay. So I had not done any clinics or masterclasses on that. I had just had this concept in my head. And so, you know, about to get on that stage, I realized, you know, like the night before, like, man, I haven't really presented this to an audience. So I started writing things down just to like clarify my thoughts. And I think it came off really well. I was really happy about it, but it also was a little unnerving because that was the first time that I had hit the stage at PASIC and hadn't presented this material numerous times. Mm. Yeah, hadn't been road tested, so. Right. 
Uh, and then, you know, um, I'm curious also uh, uh, along these lines, you know, you talk about all the, the drumming influences that you've had and, and that you've learned from and then who you've studied with. And that's all very kind of apples to apples. But I also read a lot about, you know, your love and appreciation of Alan Toussaint and and the stuff, you know, you guys did right after he passed, you know, to kind of honor him and, and the interactions you've had with him. And you talk about him as an influence. That's kind of an apples to oranges thing, if only because, you know, piano player. But I still couldn't help but feel that, you know, from what I read, you you were personally influenced by him. So I'm curious, how is Alan Toussaint and his piano work influence you as a drummer? Well, it's his music and his, of course, his piano playing, but his songwriting, his music, his, the way that he could, he could write a song or, or present a song and you instantly knew it was him, but the way that he could produce a song and he's not even performing on the song, but you could tell by the vocal harmonies or you could tell by the horn parts that that's an Alan Toussaint production. He had an undeniable fingerprint musically, mm. no matter how he was involved. If he sang, obviously, if he played piano, obviously, you would hear him right away. But he also, even if he was not physically on the recording, but you could hear the way that he was harmonizing the, the background vocals and the way that he was arranging the horn parts, you could tell that that's Alan Tucson. He, so I have striven to, or I've strived to have an identifiable voice as a musician, as a drummer, as an artist. So that's one of the things that I've taken away from Alan. Mm -hmm. And then also the way that he's presented himself as a gentleman and a class act over the years. And so I always want to try to present myself in that in that way as well no oh, so you've in other words you learned a lot of off-stage lessons as well as on-stage lessons from him yeah absolutely i mean he just you know you never heard or hear a bad word or you know a, a you know a, a disparaging thing said about Alan Tucson. You know, everybody's interaction with him was, oh man, he was such a class act. He was, you know, so professional and so courteous and gracious and just, you know, showed up and did the best, the best presentation that anybody would expect, you know? Mm. I mean, you know, when he showed up to Jazz Fest, you, you can't drive into Jazz Fest, right? You right. Can, there are parking lots and, you know, anytime Alan, Alan Toussaint performed, they would escort his Rolls Royce to, to behind the stage at uh. Jazz Fest and there was a space for him, <laughs> you know? It's like, you know, he, he always just like, you know, he arrived in class, he walked on stage in class, he was always dressed to the nines and you know he just had a an air about him that we're just like wow yeah that 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 gentleman knows how to conduct himself <laughs> and then staying with the keys theme um and and jazz fest and you guys have have different guests that sit in with you uh on jazz fest and and uh one recurring such guest is is a client of mine john papa grow and uh, and I know he loves playing with you guys. And I'm curious, what do you think, you know, from your perspective, what does John bring to the mix when he's playing with you? Oh, you know, just the first word that comes out of my, up to my mind is, is fun. You know, <laughs> he, he's there to have fun and, and he brings joy to the table. You know, you really want to play with musicians who, who have a joyous spirit about them. And he has that, you know, like he brings, he brings joy when he comes uh, to play and, and he shows up prepared and, and you know that, you know, that you're going to have a good time and you know that it, it's gonna, it's gonna be, 
it's going to be on a level that's pro and and fun mm -hmm. you know and, yeah and so uh, i've known john for a long long time and, uh and you know he's he's a great guy and a great musician and 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 fun mm -hmm. and then you guys uh in in recent years have been integrating an array of different singers uh um you know often multiple singers on the same album what do you look for in a singer what makes a singer a good match for galactic that's a great question and i would say the first and foremost element would be personality hmm. and so you know our current singer jelly angelica joseph she has just personality galore you know yeah. and, <laughs> and and then Erica Falls, same thing. Uh, Corey Glover, Houseman, you know. So, just all of these these singers that we've had over time, and then you know Charlie Tuno, we have as a recurring guest too. And it's just, you know, it's a powerful, loud funk band. And then to get in front of that band, you've got to be able to you know, project vocally, sure, but also have some kind of uh, personality that that is enjoyable to the audience and the band. And that's usually what we're looking for. A great vocalist, yes, but also somebody who has a lot of personality. All right. Because, yeah, I, I could see where an argument could be made that there is tons and tons of really good singers out there, but there's a small subsection of that group that have a presence on stage. And so is yeah. that what you're kind of talking about? Oh yeah, absolutely. Presence. Yeah. Mm. You know, and, and I mean, Jelly who's with us now, she really has that, you know, and to where when she's on stage, you just, you can't take your eyes off. You're just like, oh my goodness, this person is so fun. So they are having such a great time. I can't stop watching, you know. Yeah. And, and, and speaking of Angelica of um, and and some of the live videos that I've been, I watched before doing uh, for prep for this, um, you guys have a new song out with her called Float Up. Yes. And I'm curious, how how did something like that get created? How do you write with Angelica? Yeah, so that's a great question. So we usually start off laying down drums and then and then they'll pick what they like and the you know, Robert Mercurio, Ben Elman produce most of our stuff and then they start laying down some bass and some some keyboards and some guitar. And then maybe they'll lay down some horns and then we start presenting that to our vocalists and they start working on they start working on things um and then usually we have we have some writers that we've been working with lately princess shaw and boyfriend in particular and they will help flesh out some of the the lyrical content mm. and then sometimes they'll sing a song but then some with that case float up we worked on it and then and then got it ready for jelly to sing yeah okay and you know you mentioned uh uh you know a, a number of the people you mentioned are featured on the most recent album already ready already uh what i found fascinating about that album in particular is that you guys had way more songs than you needed for a single album um and so you like picked okay what's going to fit with this one and then we'll put the rest you know down the line what fascinates me is that so often i read about bands and they you know just barely make create enough songs for an album and, and sometimes they're writing things last minute how are you guys so prolific that you have too many songs to fit on one album right well we have our own studio and when we're not on the road, we usually go into the studio. At least somebody is in there working on stuff, either Robert or Ben, and I've been going in a lot lately working on my stuff. 
and you know we're in there most weekdays working on songs working on material and so we felt like with already ready already we had a batch of songs that worked together but then when some of these other songs we felt like they would work together and they should they could use a couple more songs so we should put them in their own batch instead of trying to make like you know a, a record and, and forcing it into a bigger record nobody really listens to records from front to back so much new releases anymore you know um classic records sure but but new releases um we just didn't feel like we needed to put a whole lot of songs so let's hold some songs and put them together with a batch that's going to work better together in the future so hmm. so we we just going in all the time that's kind of how we are always having songs in the works or in the backlog because mm -hmm. it's yeah it's I, it's a rare case that you know i've heard about people being that prolific and then but uh so it's just for you guys it just never stops and then just every every so often along the way well we should put some of these together in an album it sounds like yeah i mean that's kind of uh we have released things as singles and then we started on a label and then we released put them together so yeah we re we try different ways of releasing things because there's no you know in today's climate especially now with things changing like they are i mean there's just there's no set way of doing things so mm -hmm. so we we've especially now that we have our own label we have the liberty of of trying different things out just release a single just release you know a, you know, a smaller record with, I think it's got like eight songs on it or something instead of, you know, 10, 11 songs. So, yeah. so we, we're just trying different things and just constantly putting stuff out, but, but trying different things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm wondering what advice you have for other up and coming musicians in terms of being independent, because, um, you know, you guys never, you're in an industry where they like to put people in boxes. All right, you are, you know, a rock artist, a jazz artist, etc. Galactic never really fit in any one particular box. And, you know, also just starting off with so heavy on the instrumentals and stuff, you know, and, and yet you, you built the following and you defied the odds. And you're such a, a, a great independent artist organization. And more and more, it seems like that's what's going to be required if a band is going to survive in the long term. And I'm wondering what advice do you have for up and coming bands about, you know, how they can be independent and self-sustaining? I mean, that's a great, that's a great question. And I wish I had a good answer for you, but <laughs> you know, I mean, there's so much competition now, and there's so many new bands coming out all the time. And and it's, with what's going on now with the pandemic and nobody can play live shows right now, I mean, we just don't know what the future is going to look like. So, you know, the, the one thing I can say is that if you, for young bands who are starting to get into making music the only thing i can suggest is that you just absolutely have to love it you just have to be it has to be this is what i'm doing there's nothing else in the world that i want to do and you have to love it because it's it's not an easy way to to make a living it looks easy when you see people <laughs> on stage and you're like oh that looks great but that is like, you know, what percentage of, of that time on stage and then, you know, sleeping on airport floors and flying coach and living on a bus with 11 people. I mean, you know, those are the things that people don't see. And, and those are the things that are challenging. And then you work that hard for 25 years and then, you know, you're still, nobody's getting rich, you know? Um, mm -hmm we're making a living but but it's there's probably other things that we could have decided to do when we were younger that wouldn't have been as challenging and would have you know allowed us to to even make a better living but you but i wouldn't change it for anything because because i love it 
you know, and we love it as a band. But mm-hmm. but if you're going to get into it as a young musician, you have to know that it's it's it is challenging, and it and it, there's there are no guarantees, and it's very uncertain uh, how you're going to make a living doing this. I mean, you can you know playing live shows. That's not even a thing that we can do right now. So you know, hoping for licensing and and placement in movies or ads, but you can't guarantee that. It's not like, okay, I can go out and make sure that I make this happen, right? It's, yeah. So there's there are a lot of uncertainties involved, but if you're gonna do it, uh, I encourage people to do it if they love it. Mm. And I mean, and speaking of uh, uncertain times in the pandemic, you guys are a really unique situation in that you are both band members and venue owners uh having uh, become the stewards of the the legendary tipitinas in new orleans a, a couple of years back and i'm wondering uh during this pandemic how do you work to preserve both how are you working to both preserve a band and preserve a venue yeah i mean it's challenging i mean luckily you know, we've gotten the PPP from uh, from the government and some SBA help for tips, but um, I mean, we've had to make some really difficult decisions, and we're we're gonna have to reach out and ask people to extend their generosity. I mean, we already have started, and we've already seen some wonderful examples of people, you know, reaching out to us and extending their generosity because they want to see Tipitinas continue. They want to see Galactic continue. So, you know, we just don't know when we're going to be able to get back to, I don't want to say business as usual because we ne- we may never be able to get back to business as usual. We may not be able to have 800 people in a club anytime soon or maybe ever again. So we're trying to think of new ways of doing things and new ways of bringing in bringing in funds and and you know we we have conference calls and discussions almost daily and and the challenging part is that it's such a fluid situation and things are changing so much and mm-hmm. the regulations are changing the rules are changing and uh and if we have a second wave or you know any of that kind of stuff that's going to change everything so I wish I had more solid answers, but we are doing everything we can, and it is the the thing that we wake up and go to bed thinking about every every day. <laughs> Switching to a, a lighter note, um, you know, I, I read in this one piece, you know, you talked about, you know, you used to have this kind of credo of, you know, play every gig like it could be your last gig. And then recently you switched it to play every gig like it's your own wedding. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I got to wonder, what is it like for a professional musician to play his own wedding? I mean, it's very joyous, you know, and I guess I'm trying to say that in a in a whimsical way to express to people who who don't play gigs or haven't experienced that what it's like but it's it's to play with 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 abandon and joy right Mm. and to play in a way that you're not trying to play perfectly you're not trying to play in a way that you feel like you're being judged but you're playing in a way that you're feeling like you're being loved and you're being, and you're exuding joy, and you're exuding love, and you're getting that back in return. And when you're playing your own wedding, you're surrounded by people who love you, and you're surrounded by your closest people, your favorite people, people that you hand selected as the most important people in your life, and you're all having a good time, and you're, you, for me, when I sat in at my own wedding with one of my favorite bands that I 
that I put together, which was my trio of David Torkinowski, James Singleton, but I had Shannon Powell on drums, and Shannon Powell plays with sheer joy, and then Skerrick played saxophone, you know, mm. for most of it. So um, some of my favorite musicians, and then when I sat in, I got to play with an amazing band, and I, and I, it was one of the best days of my life, and I got to just play with abandon and joy, and it was, and I felt like I played great. <laughs> <laughs> was there ever a thought about not sitting in, or you know, or was there ever? Uh, I would think if you were also, you know, one of the band members hired, you know, you'd be a little hesitant to ask you to like even sit in or even talk to you about sitting in to be like well it's his day and i don't want to pull him away from his new bride and you know it... yeah i mean i talked about it with my wife and and you, you know we said well it will play it by ear if we feel like it cool and if i don't feel like it you know then then no but we were everybody was having such a blast and it was so much fun and the music was so killing I was just like, oh, can I sit down and play for a minute? And she's like, of course. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was it was kicks. I had a blast. Cool. All right, well, that covers everything I wanted to talk about. Is there anything we didn't hit upon that you want to discuss? Oh, just, you know, I mean, for anybody who's interested in what I'm doing drumming-wise, if you're a drummer or, or even if you're interested or if you know a drummer, you know, I'm going to continue doing these Wednesday night master classes on Facebook at seven o'clock central. And then I, you know, I'm presenting material that is on my drum academy. So if anybody's interested in Stanton Moore Drum Academy, um, you know, stantonmoredrumacademy.com, I've got, I put up all the, the things that I present as part of what I am as a drummer. A lot of that is up there, and then I'm also doing these these master classes on Wednesdays. So, um, you know, I love sharing that knowledge. I mean, I've been touring with Galactic for 25 years, but I've probably been touring for, you know, total close to 30 years, and I love sharing that knowledge with people. 